In light of a recently announced Phase 2A study data, as well as a up to a $30 million deal with Exoma Royalties, BioInvent will be joining us. Standing next to me is Martin Welshoff, as well as Andres McAllister. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mm, Martin, I think we'll begin with you. Could you tell us a little bit about BioInvent and perhaps uh, what is going on right now at the company? What is currently up to date? Absolutely. So. BioInvent is a company based in southern Sweden. Uh, we are an immune oncology company, uh, currently roughly 120 people. Quite integrated company in that sense. We not only do antibody discovery, target discovery, we also do our own manufacturing, uh, our own formulation and clinical development, which is really a, like a powerhouse in immune oncology. And in that sense, we currently have uh, five programs in six clinical trials. And we recently had a couple of news, as you were saying, so we had good phase 2A data for both of our lead programs, Turbo 6 and 1808, and I believe we'll discuss that later in more detail with, with Andres. And then in addition, we were able to monetize an on-core asset. So the Soma royalty uh, agreement that you uh, refer to, uh, it's a $30 million uh, deal, $20 million upfront, $10 million on a milestone, which is then once the second indication is approved. And maybe I give a little bit of background here. So this is based on uh, a deal that we did in 2003. Soma had very dominant IP that uh, Biomed needed at that time. So under this cross license, they got access, Soma got access to our antibody library technology. And they then did a deal with Takeda that generated this antibody that is now in, in phase three. And Soma is basically now consolidating their uh, royalty and, and milestones. And we are monetizing at a time point where it makes a lot of sense to us since we could use the money now very well to push our uh, core assets forward. And then also everybody knows that sometimes phase three uh, clinical trials fail and then there would be nothing. Could you elaborate a little bit on the 10 million that is uh, conditioned to the milestone? What is the milestone from Exoma's perspective? Yeah, so basically they have initiated a clinical phase three for, for the first indication but already uh, announced that they also will uh, do a second indication, but that has not been started yet, but will be started soon. And once this second indication is approved, then we will get the 10 million. But the important thing for us is the 20 million that we can, uh, will get upon signing the deal. Yeah. Let's go further down then as we now turn to Andres. Uh, when it comes to the, uh, the data you were able to announce regarding your phase 2A study, this is for the candidate BI1206. It's in combination with the uh, rituximab and the uh, Colquens uh, for uh, non-Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma. Can you tell us what uh, sort of data you were able to present as well as uh, your uh, impressions on the results? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I've been worried very much about is trying to generate uh, safety and efficacy data at the same time, which is not always the case. You can generate drugs that are very efficacious, but that have um, problems with uh, safety. Uh, we give a lot of consideration to that, and perhaps because uh, one of the reasons is that we work and we target the tumor microenvironment, which is what happens inside really the tumor. Our drugs have proven to be very safe, well tolerated, and in addition to that, quite efficacious. So the data that we're presenting shows that when you combine these three drugs, one is rituximab, which is a drug that is very commonly used uh, to treat these patients, but they become resistant with time. So one of the, what we are adding with our drug is to avoid that resistance. And in addition to that, we are adding another drug, which is also very widely used in the community by, to treat those patients. And with this triplet, we can accomplish very high response rates, pay people uh, respond very frequently to treatment, which is very good, even if they have been treated with those drugs in, uh, in the past, in particular with rituximab. Uh, we obtained very high response rates, comparable to the best performing drugs in the, in the space, such as by specific antibodies, etc. So uh, we get very good response rates and very safe and convenient way to treat these patients, which is a very important factor that you need to put in the equation. Uh, so we're very happy about that because the response rates that we're getting are uh, very competitive in the space. Uh, aside, you know, being efficacious, they're safe and convenient. 
one important point there maybe also to inject uh, regarding the positioning. So especially in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the patient population is very frail. So they're elderly and very frail. And what you need is exactly the combination that Andres was referring to. That means uh, good efficacy, but equally important is the safety, as you said at the beginning, because otherwise uh, those patients wouldn't benefit really. Are so, you more confident now heading into phase 2B and perhaps even phase 3 than you were before? Uh, we are definitely. Uh, we will generate more data. So this is just uh, the first part of the study. We are continuing. We're recruiting patients. Um, and as soon as we have a larger data set, we will, you know, the, the, of course, we need to show that all this trend continues in the right direction. But now we are more confident than we were a few months ago, and we will be more confident in the future. So, you know, uh, the, the, the trend is uh, where we want it to be, and that's what's important. Another candidate is BI1910, also heading now towards the phase 2A after a successful phase 1. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Are you as confident there and, uh, and um, what are the steps you expect to take? Yeah, so 1910 will be moving into, into phase 2A as you, as you say, but perhaps more importantly BI1808. Uh, that is the one that uh, is uh, ahead of the pack. Um, that is uh, we, by all uh, accounts, is the first in class, so the first drug that is being developed for that particular target in the world. So we're very uh, happy and, and excited about that, but more excited uh, we are about the data that that has generated. We have seen, um, we had reported recently last year, uh, um, single agent activity, so uh, as monotherapy uh, activity in solid tumors. And now uh, what we are reporting is very interesting data in a very difficult to treat tumor type. It's called T-cell lymphoma, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Uh, the, that is uh, a high and med medical need. There is no good drugs to treat those patients. Um, and so we, are, we have a very safe and the, the, the responses that we've seen are quite impressive. Uh, and for the time being in, in very, very advanced patients. So to see those very, very advanced patients that have seen every treatment available to them, to see them respond to a new treatment is very impressive. Uh, that has generated a great deal of interest in, in, the, in the investigators that are participating in the study. So we, we anticipate that uh, this will only be, uh, go in crescendo so um, we're very excited, um, as you probably mentioned. So we, we recently obtained a uh, fast track designation, which is uh, a priority, um, priority review system offered by the FDA, which basically allows you to have very frequent conversations with FDA to have, uh, if, you, if you meet the criteria, to have access to being, to have uh, accelerated approval. Uh, etc. So you basically partner with FDA so that you do the best development possible for that drug because there is a, a high unmet medical need. So uh, we're super excited, enthusiastic about what we're seeing and, and very happy about that. Indeed, 1808 has gotten a fast track designation, but it also has a orphan drug designation. And I'm curious about that. When you have both designations, what does that change in terms of the trials? Yeah, they're, di they're actually different things. Orphan drug designation basically protects the, uh, the, the lifespan of the drug farther into the future. So you have a, an extended protection. So you can exploit the, the, the uniqueness of your drug for a longer period of time. Fast track designation is basically uh, as I mentioned before, a way so that uh, your drug is considered uh, a preferred drug. So the review times are shorter, the, uh, the exchanges with FDA can be more frequent. Uh, they basically uh, help you in, in developing the drug in the best possible way. And, and it should open the way to get approval uh, based on phase two data, which is very important because it shortens the timelines to be able to, to market the drug uh, uh, in, uh, tremendously. So that's, that's the important. Uh, so in sort of simple terms then, you get it to market quicker and it's also protected in the market for longer. Correct, hmm. yes. Mm. Uh, Ma Martin, I think we could uh, turn to you now uh, as we head into the rest of the year, 2025, uh, from a more broad perspective uh, for Holobioinvent. What, what is the current plan there? 
Yeah, basically to move ahead with the broad portfolio that I uh, briefly described at the beginning of our conversation. And uh, just to summarize, so now we have the updates around the two lead programs, uh, 1808 and, and CTCL, uh, 1206 and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. There will be also an update coming uh, soon for 1206. We didn't discuss that at all in solid cancer, uh, which is also uh, quite uh, interesting, where we have also achieved interesting data. And then during the second half of this year, uh, we'll have further updates around 1808 because we're not only developing this as a single agent, but also in combination with pembrolizumab. So there will be an update around that. And then you mentioned uh, 1910. Uh, so also during the second half, we'll have uh, further single agent data for 1910, but also combination data. And then 1607, which is our second anti-FCGMR to be antibody besides 1206. Uh, there we also will have the first data set by the end of the year. So we'll be very busy. And obviously this uh, relates to the broad portfolio that we have, which is very unique for a European biotech company. Mm. And Andres, if we talk from a purely trial perspective, what uh, highlights do you expect for the rest of 2025? So, um, as I mentioned, for BI 1808, we, we are actually pursuing the recruitment uh, uh, in order to make that uh, a more robust data set. We need to uh, work a little bit on the regimen so and the um, excuse me on the on the dose uh, dose optimization. Make sure you're giving the patients the right dose. Uh, that is something called Project Optimus, and we're uh, uh, obviously taking that into consideration for 1808 uh, in CTCL. Uh, the other all the other trials are recruiting very well, but I am particularly excited about what uh, Martin just mentioned, which is. Um, BI-1206, the same drug, but now in combination with uh, pembrolizumab. Uh, we are doing that in solid tumors and we are, uh, you know, given the already very exciting data that we've seen, uh, we have um, already moved, we're moving into the phase 2A part of the study. We will be doing that in lung cancer, in, in melanoma. And, uh, you know, there are a number of possibilities that open to, uh, to us now as possibilities. One of them is to, since we are really changing what happens inside the tumor, is to treat that uh, uh, in earlier stage of, 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 of treatment, in particular for lung cancer, which is a huge, uh, important uh, indication, the probably is the most frequent type of cancer. Uh, and and uh, it, we, we could impact the way you treat those patients. And, and I think that is uh, a huge upside and a potential uh, very important inflection point for the company. Mm. Then we'll be excited to hearing more. Martin Welshoff and uh, Andres McAllister, thank you very much for being here and answering our questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.